Welcome to the new shop. This whole journey starts off with me driving down to Calgary, which is about 300 kilometers south of my city. Um, lovely gentleman, the Dr. Phil Experience on Instagram, was willing to part with this lathe and let me take ownership of it. Uh, so basically I went down there with some riggers, we hauled it out of his garage, uh, plopped it onto a trailer, strapped it down, and then brought it back to my area of town, um, which turned out to be actually a little bit easier than I thought it was. And uh, this is where we ended up. So it's uh, Monday morning at about 9 o'clock. The lathe should be delivered any time now. Um, it's coming from, like I said, three hours away, so got to give the guys a little bit of lenience on the time. Um, but I'm going to do some computer work and some shipping stuff while I wait uh, because this beautiful natural light is something that I don't normally have, and I'm very excited to work in it. So we will wait till the lathe comes, and then we'll do a time lapse of them loading it out because that's, that's where it's going to go. So about a second after ending that video clip, uh, the truck pulled up with the lathe on it. Um, I already had the cameras set up so I could time lapse some of this, and I figured the rigger would probably need a set of eyes, uh, so I wasn't uh, I wasn't fiddling with cameras too much as opposed to just making sure that it didn't fall on my driveway. Uh, super uneventful, basically just drove it in, set it down, uh, put it on some pucks so I can lift it with a pallet jack and position it later. That's it. This uh, setting on the camera right now is what I'd normally shoot at, about like ISO 400 and a wide open lens, which is like f1.2, it's a really fast lens. If I turn the lights on, you'll see nothing. It's insane in here. It's like an operating room. I love it. So the lathe made it here in one piece. It's sitting behind me, so let's go through it and I'll show you everything that we have to fix on it to make it work. I mean, nothing is really broken, but everything has to be converted because uh, it runs on 600 volt three phase power. And unfortunately, I don't have that in my house. So we'll have to fix that up. So first of all, it's got this super cool, like retro space capsule looking cover for it, which, uh, I'll clean it all up, but everything seems to function well. Thankfully, the only acrylic pieces that are smashed are the end pieces, uh, which are just flat. So those are super easy to fix. Uh, these ones, I'll just give them a little buffing because they're gonna get gross anyways with chips being slung and oil and whatnot. So yeah, I'm very excited, as you can probably tell. Another thing that is super nice about this whole lathe is um, the fact that it came with manuals. When do you ever get a manual with old equipment? And not only do I have one manual, I have a box of manuals. I have everything that ever was released for this lathe. I even have, what do I have in here? We're gonna find one. I have uh, I have like tooling catalogs and like literally all the literature I would ever want for this machine is in this box, including about like, I think, uh, where is it? Yeah, I believe it's this one, is just electrical schematics for just this machine, not for all the machines that Hardinge makes, just this machine. There's like, I don't know, 300 pages of schematics. I don't even know how you can have that many, but I mean, the cabinet that went with this machine was like 2000 pounds of just electronics to make it go. Uh, that's the part I'm missing. But anyways, so I have no shortage of technical information, which is super nice when I start tearing into things because it's like, how do I remove this part? Oh, just look in the maintenance manual or the service manual or the operator's manual or the extended operator's manual or the appendix to the mat. Like it's just, it's awesome. It makes life so much easier. So thank you to whoever random person that bought this machine way back when it was built and decided to keep all the information together. You are a lifesaver. And thank you, Phil, for not burning this box because uh, it makes my life easy. First order of business, I'm gonna remove everything off of it that I don't currently need. So this whole gondola capsule contraption is coming off. Um, all the access panels are coming off. Basically as much as I can get down or strip it down as much as I can. Uh, so when I move it here to its kind of permanent resting pay, uh, position, I don't have to worry about getting access to anything. So let's do that. So once I started removing all the components off this thing, I realized uh, removing the capsule, not required. I can access everything on this machine. Um, Whoever, whatever team designed this, uh, use their head. Everything is accessible, easy to replace, easy to maintain. Um, yeah, no access issues. So I just moved forward like this. Taking all the panels off, uh, the next step I wanted to check was the oil sump. Uh, so I took the chip pan or the chip guard out, found a bunch of oil in there, dropped a screw to make sure I know how deep the oil is, uh, and then drained the sump so I could find my screw and keep from dropping more crap into there. I took all the cover plates off of the carriage here. This just gains me access to the... Uh, encoder feedback for the turret, as well as all the pneumatics for it, uh, something I'm gonna have to interface with down the line. And I also took all the covers off the servos and 
electronic covers and whatnot because once again replacing all that so i need access i then went ahead and removed all the bellows and everything i'm not going to be machining on this for a bit yet uh, so i don't need the protection of it and it just lets me look at everything without having to constantly be taking stuff off another genius point pretty much every faster on this machine is the exact same size uh, which is awesome anything that was separate i obviously bagged and tagged in its own area um, but pretty much every screw is interchangeable which makes life so much easier when you're doing this kind of work so once again, props to the uh, team that designed it. Smart thinking. I could do that all day. That's like the most fun part. So this is where we left it last night. I got basically every cover removed, um, access to all the ball screws so I can move them around. Uh, here's one. Yeah, it uh, moves quite nicely. Um, you can hear the uh, gear train in the back because there's just a bunch of clockwork in the back here that spins the encoders and resolvers and revolvers and all kinds of other weird names they use for that. Um, we're going to get rid of most of that because uh, we're going to put modern servos on it so I don't need all that information to drive just a DC motor because that's integrated nowadays. Um, I moved the carriage around, got everything checked out, basically looking for rust spots and nicks on the bed. Um, the bed is immaculate. Uh, there's really no problems. There's a super minor bit of surface rust here that should be very easy to remove. Um, that's just from where the way wiper was sitting. Um, so it's the one spot that it pushed oil away. That's a nice thing about a machine bathed in oil. There's really no point of uh, checking for rust because it's just covered in oil. So uh, that was nice. It was actually nice that it was put away with oil on it. Um, just basically left in its running state because uh, it protected it. The uh, next step was getting the collet out of the taper here. Um, it was cinched in there quite well. So on the back, there's a pneumatic driven collet closer, but if I loosen a couple screws, I'm able to actuate it by hand. Uh, so that's all I did. I basically just decoupled it and spun it by hand to remove the collet. And I just wanted to check the uh, taper in here uh, to make sure there was no pitting or fretting or anything weird. Um, it's once again, nice and smooth, covered in oil, so uh, no signs of rust or anything. I'm very happy with that. The next thing to do is basically get all the flat belts and everything removed. Uh, so I can spin this freely just on its headstock bearings. And I'll put a dial indicator in here just to check. I, I don't foresee, I don't even have a dial indicator accurate enough to measure um, any kind of perceived run out here, but we'll check it regardless because that seems like the thing to do. And I'll put some weight on it, move it around, uh, make sure there's no issues with the bearings. But like I said, just, just from hand feeling it, my super technical way of hand turning it, um, it feels very, very nice. So that's wonderful. The very last thing to do is these, this air turret here. So this is the eight position turret. Basically what it does is it pops up, it rotates, and then it pops back down. Um, here you can see there's a, um, basically a, I think there's a magnetic based um, positioning system. So it can tell um, there's a motor. It's actually an air driven motor. It's like a worm gear uh, that spins this whole contraption and another air cylinder that lifts it. And they work in unison. So that's gonna be the most complicated thing because I'm gonna have to probably put some dedicated electronics on this just to run those um, solenoids correctly so that during a tool change, um, it pops it, spins it, and then drops it and locks it. Um, I know some people have removed the air motor and just put a put a like a stepper motor on here to index it, but the air motor is actually pretty cool and it's really fast. Uh, so I'd like to try to retain that. Um, so that's, that's the next biggest hurdle. Um, and once that's uh, popping, locking, and spinning, uh, there's basically nothing on here that I'm too afraid of. There's a 600 volt oil coolant pump, um, but that's just sourcing a motor. Um, so that won't be too bad. And uh, then getting the hydraulic pneumatic part off tool moving. Um, once again, that's nothing too, too critical. And then everything else is just pneumatic. So it's either seals or uh, air pressure. So I'm not too concerned. Those, uh, those would be the main issues. That's what I'm gonna be futzing with next. Um, but unfortunately, I actually have to do some work as opposed to just work on this. Uh, so this is going to sit for a little bit. So it's where we're going to leave it for this week. Um, by next week, I should have a bunch of new updates for you guys. I did some amazing cool meteorite machining and uh, all kinds of weird pen stuff. But I'm not going to roll that into this video because it'll be like 14 hours long if I put it into this one. So that'll be uh, coming in future videos. I'm very excited to share that because it went out swimmingly well. So I can't be the only electronics dork. Um, on this side of the machine was the main power distribution. Um, all the heavy electronics are all, majority of it were housed in that giant 2000 pound stack that also accompanied this machine. Unfortunately, a lot of these machines when they're sold, they don't come with that stack because uh, once again, it's just like, it's like shipping another machine and it's all antiquated. No one's probably gonna use it. Um, so this side, if we open it, that's just like me. 
Um, if, uh, if I were going to use this, this would all be useful to me, but right now, um, basically none of it is of use to me. I mean, there's some cool stuff in here, big transformers and whatnot, but for the most part, uh, this is all just going to be an empty cabinet where I'm going to put all the uh, new electronics. Yeah, you, just, you can look around if you're a dork in this regard. I love looking at old stuff. So interesting. The wiring on this side is not as neat. Let's go to the control side because the wiring there is... Primo. So if the other side of the machine was mainly big power handling, this was all signal conditioning control stuff. So you can see it's uh, significantly neater. Um, the wiring is very nice. Whoever did it cared about it. Um, I, I just love neat wiring. I don't care what it's for, it just pleases my brain. Uh, all these boards were like signal conditioning boards, input output stuff, um, just various logic for the copious amounts of solenoids and uh, relays in this machine, bunch of relays, um, rectifiers, whatnot. Giant capacitors, breakouts, just basically stuff that would take all the control logic that would come from the giant stack, come through here into all these wires and start interfacing with this stuff, some transformers to base the 120 dumb, some DC stuff, and a little bit of control um, for the air turret. Once again, a whole box of basically nothing I'm gonna use. I'll probably reuse um, a lot of these little relays. Um, but other than that, this whole box is pretty much of no use to me, which is kind of unfortunate how fast technology progresses and how useless stuff becomes fairly quickly. But such is life. Still pretty. In the last area of this machine that I'm kind of still wrapping my head around, um, basically how it works is uh, this big motor that's the main drive motor and it drives a gang shaft and a bunch of clutches and pulleys and whatnot in the back and then flat belts that go up to the uh, headstock and spin the spindle. The only thing is there's this large motor with a ball screw on here that drives this, uh, it's a secondary, uh, I forgot there's an actual term for that, jack shaft. Um, it drives it up and down and that has something to do with the speed changing but as far as I can tell it's basically two belts coupled like this this on either side and that shaft moves up and down but if it moves any which way it tensions or loosens one of the belts um, and I just I can't fathom in my head how it functions yet I've read through the manual a few times and looked at it and I just can't see how it works um, it's pretty cool that using a ball screw to move that um, but yeah I'm probably gonna reuse or reuse as much of that as I can because if I can just replace this motor with a, um, a single phase unit or a, like a 223 phase driven by an inverter um, that'll be significantly easier than trying to bypass all this stuff. So I'll probably just replace this and get this pulley to fit on the motor and uh, reuse all that stuff. So um, as far as I can tell, I technically wouldn't have to do anything with this to get the spindle to spin because it's all coupled right now. But I know it does something. I just gotta just gotta work it through uh, in my head to figure out exactly how that happens. Yeah, yeah, just more nerdy stuff. I just I'm into this. I like it. And this is the last kind of weird uh, area of the machine. This is the pneumatic, oiler, and hydraulic system kind of all coupled and uh, joined together. I'm going through the manual, basically trying to wrap my head around how everything here works. Um, but as far as I can tell, it's an air pressured oiler, which oils all the parts of the machine and uh, provides um, pressure to the hydraulic pneumatic system for the cutoff blade and whatnot. Um, the people that had owned it earlier were nice enough to basically print um, little labels for everything, all the oils and coolants that they want. Coolants, everything is oil on this machine. Um, so it's nice that I can currently just purchase the exact same oil it's been running its entire life. Uh, so there's no surprises for it because obviously if it's worked that long, it's going to continue to work for me. So uh, that's the system we're going to run. I know some people have converted these over to uh, like a water-based coolant system, but it says specifically in the manual that you should not be running any kind of water-based coolants. I mean, a lot, of, a lot has happened since this lathe has been built. I'm sure the technology has gotten better and I'm sure there are water-based solutions you can run in this, um, but I'm just not gonna take that chance. I'm gonna run oil in it, which is a little bit scary when I'm cutting titanium, um, but nonetheless, that's what we'll run because that's what it'll be happy with. That's what it's run its entire life and we'll continue to do that. So that's where I'm gonna leave you for today. I have a bunch of B-roll that I have to roll into this edit um, and then get it posted. And then I have a bunch of actual work that I have to get finished as opposed to just tinkering with this. It was what I would like to do, but um, yeah, I actually have some other commitments I have to make. Um, so we'll continue plugging away on this. Um, we'll slowly start moving stuff up into this new shop. Uh, it's gonna be a few weeks yet because I have to run electrical. Um, I have to do some final positioning yet. We'll talk more about that. We'll talk more about this shop. I was just so excited to talk about this lathe that uh, that's basically all we've talked about in this video. So um, 
thanks as always for watching everybody and uh i will see you it's always been two weeks since i've been posting these videos but this last week has been just insane for just uh doing all this stuff so hopefully we'll be back to a regular weekly schedule uh next week so i'm gonna say see you next week and uh we'll take it from there take care Bye bye